In the final video of today's lecture, I wanted to talk a bit about contracts. And contracts are just a, con a construct or a, um, a language feature uh, that Record has, because it is not a typed language, as you know, um, or a statically typed language. And um, what contracts give you is actually a very powerful uh, capability of creating um, preconditions and postconditions on your code. So you can add, you can enforce some uh, preconditions to be checked before uh, your code is executed. And the idea is that whoever calls a function has to be able to meet certain preconditions. So let's say you have, you are computing the square root and you want to ensure that you don't have a negative number, you could enforce a precondition that the value is non-negative. Um, Similarly, you might want to make sure that your code is doing the right thing and you could have post conditions which are in a way uh, um, a way to confirm that the code should be behaving the way it, it should. So let's say you, you, you have a very, um, you want to say I want to compute something that should return an even number and you can add as a post condition that your return value is a, an even number. And then whenever the function is called, um, the, re the return value is compared against uh, this post condition. And if your function breaks that uh, condition, you get an error uh, saying that you have an implementation error in your function. So this is an idea that dates back to Eiffel and Bertrand Meyer. Um, Bertrand Meyer introduced this language called Eiffel uh, that had the, the main focus was uh, adding pre and post conditions to improve uh, code quality. Um, some uh, pre and post, some languages have pre and post conditions that are checked uh, either at runtime or statically at compile time, if you will. So in, in some languages such as F star and Daphne, these are um, programming languages that have conditions which are verified at compile time. That means that there is an analysis going in place that just considers all possible inputs and outputs and ensures that all your pre and post conditions are correct. And this is actually quite powerful because it give, lets you do very interesting um, guarantees. It, people have been using this uh, to verify uh, encryption algorithms and so on. So FSTAR is notably a very um, cool project that people have been using to prove the correctness of certain algorithms. Daphne is a project that is uh, backed by Microsoft and is also quite successful in, 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 in this use where you're trying to define an algorithm and it will want to prove the correctness according to some pre and post conditions. In Racket, though, pre and post conditions are checked dynamically, so they are checked whenever your code runs. So you can think of them as assertions that are, are being introduced in place. So how do you introduce, how do you specify or declare um, contracts in Racket? The way you do it is with this define slash contract. So when you, you do this is exactly a, a definition, but now you're also specifying the definitions contract. So in this case, what I'm writing is a function. So this is a function that takes two parameters, right? And what I'm saying is that these parameters have a certain um, signature. So what I'm saying here is that the first parameter has to be a symbol. The second parameter has to be a real and the, the result has to be a string. So here you will note that um, the last parameter is always, the last parameter that appears here is always the output parameter, the result. Um, so that's basically how you declare uh, the pre. This is a precondition of the first parameter. This is the precondition of the second parameter. And this is the post condition because it verifies or checks the result. So now let's try to play with this. So if I do f of 10, uh, 9, 
I should get an error. So let's see if that happens. Black 22. You can see here that it's saying that I got a contract violation. And it's saying that um, in the first argument, where? In the first argument, so here, it's saying that it's expecting a symbol, but I gave it a number 10. OK, so if it's expecting a symbol, let's give it x. So this is a symbol. So now let's see what happens. And if I run here, OK, so it's saying that it's expecting oh, two parameters. Of course, I have to do x, y. So the example has a bug. OK, and now what did it return? It returned the string. So here it just converted. Uh, this is like printf, but it returns a new string. And what we did was we converted the symbol and the number into a string. We said that the output is a string, and therefore we are able to return the value. But let's say we did actually a mistake, um, and we our contract says, well, the return value should be a real. But in this case, what we're doing is we're just returning a string. So this is an implementation bug and not a caller bug, right? So if we do this, then we get we get this kind of error that is saying that I define a certain contract, but my own function broke that contract. So it's saying it's bro f broke its own contract, right? Because it's not matching the um, output, the results, the post condition, right? Um, so this is a more serious uh, bug, whereas the first one where we uh, so let's put this back to string. And here I put, right? So contract violations are usage errors, whereas um, whereas breaking its own contract is an implementation error. So now the question is, did I implement my, my function wrong, incorrectly, or did I specify my contract incorrectly? Right? So that's usually how you use these things. So why do you want contracts? It's really to make your code a bit more robust. As we are increasing in the complexity of our code, um, using contract is really a great way of making your, uh, spotting your bugs earlier. What you want is to find bugs as early as possible, right? You don't want to hide bugs anywhere. And when you have an uh, error trace, you want to have the error closest to the bug as possible so that you can track it very well. So using contracts is a really great thing, great feature of Racket. And this, for instance, does not exist in uh, Scheme or Lisp, which are older versions of, or, or ancestors of the language Racket. OK, so in the remaining time, what I wanted to do is just go through the implementation of Lambda F, which is very close to what you will have in your homework 5-util. Um, and I wanted to show you how I'm using uh, the pre and post conditions. And essentially, I'm using them as type signatures. I'm just specifying what are the types that I'm expecting in, um, my, in my functions. So for instance, let's look at. Um, let me scroll to a place that is perhaps a bit interesting. Yeah, so let's see heap. Let's see how we do heaps. So if you remember how we defined heaps. What is heap? OK, almost there. Okay. So if you look at how I define heaps, they're not exactly like I show them in the slides uh, in the previous video. And the reason is because I wanted to add contracts just so that when you are using heaps, um, you as users have a very obvious uh, error messages. And so contracts really help in, in making code more defensive. When I say defensive, I mean, um, you know, I'm adding more bounds and checks to make sure that uh, its usage makes sense. Um, so let's see one example where I'm doing heap lock. 
right? And in HippoLock, the only thing that I added now was I'm specifying how we should use, um, what is the type signature, if you will, of allocating a heap. So what I'm saying is um, heap allocation is saying that the first element should be a heap of anything. We really don't care. So any slash C is just saying any value at all. And heap of a, a, is a way, is parametric. Right, so it takes a parameter, which is what is the contents, the type of the heap, of the elements containing the heap. So we're saying that any element will do. And then what is the value? So this first parameter, parameter is this one. Second parameter is V. So V is going to be any value that we're storing. And what is the result? The result is an effect, right? Uh, because that's what we're returning. So whenever we someone calls this heap lock, we're going to check if EFF is in fact an EFF, um, the return value is in fact an EFF, and it's also going to ensure that the first parameter is a heap. So that's why in our code, if we do um, let me go back here, if I do heap so if I run heap lock let me actually comment this out. So if I run heap lock and I pass something that is not a heap, I'm getting this contract violation, right? Because here I defined a contract and I specified that the first argument must be a heap. Okay, that's why I get this error. So here I have to have empty heap. And now, now everything works perfectly fine. Okay. So then most of the function, as, as you will notice, have contracts. But you can be a bit more uh, explicit. For instance, here this is a function. Uh, this is just to represent whether a heap is non-empty. And it, as you can see, I'm being quite um, expressive I, I'm, I'm talking about the contents of the heap and so on so it's quite a powerful um, functionality you can just write any function and, and do any kind of check you will um, yeah so for instance this is a heap fold so there is a functionality which is basically a fold but on heaps um, and as you might imagine the first parameter is a function, so we use this arrow to say a function that takes any value and a handle, and then it returns any value and any value. And then the last parameter, HP, it has to be a heap. So you can constrain it in multiple ways, including specifying the types of the functions that are in, in contained in it, and so on. So it's quite powerful and very useful, especially for you guys as users. Okay, and that's basically what I wanted to talk about in terms of contracts. So I hope you enjoyed this, this lesson. Have a good one.